Hey everyone, um, I'm Ryan Blue. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, basically data architecture in 2022. Um, I get a lot of people, you know, asking questions about um, the either the architecture that we built at Netflix or what I would use today, or you know, I mean, my my answer is always Iceberg, um, but <laughs> that's because I uh, I created Iceberg. Um, but I, I get a lot of questions about why Iceberg, um, and I want to go into that in a little more detail in this talk. So this is going to be a, a little higher level, but we're still mostly talking about um, data architecture um, and capabilities that come from uh, the, the table format that you choose. So uh, let's look at just what does the, the landscape look like today? Um, and I think this is um, a very simplistic picture of what everyone is trying to build. Um, we really want this multi-engine platform. In fact, most of us are already running this architecture. We're just doing it incredibly unsafely. <laughs> so um, almost everyone I talk to has Trino, Flink, Spark, uh, you know, some other engine in the mix, like maybe a Dask uh, if you're doing Python processing. And um, really what we want is some way of tying all of these engines together into a cohesive architecture, this multi-engine platform where each engine can do what it's really good at. You know, Trino and those low latency ad hoc queries, consuming data from Flink, streaming data in and constantly uh, giving you the latest up-to-date data, and then Spark for running like ML workloads and, and other things. Um, you know, being able to tie in things that you're good at, like Dask and, and really taking advantage of the Python space is critical for this as well. So this seems to be what we're, we're already building, but um, there are a lot of challenges with this. Um, first of all, before a few years ago, it was simply unsafe to use all of these engines together because reliable updates didn't exist. But even now that we have you know, two or three formats that, that provide those reliable updates, there's still a lot of confusion and, and problems in this area. So um, this new picture of reality has a lot of different uh, requirements. So first of all, we're going for you know, central table storage. And then you've got to think about well, where do we put our, our data? And this choice matters a lot because data has gravity and it pulls you towards uh, wherever you put your data. So if your data is you know, entirely in one vendor and you don't want to use only that vendor's compute technology or, or compute engine, then you know, you're in a, a, a you know, problematic spot. Um, this you know, portable compute is, is more and more uh, on people's minds, not just how do we use the same data everywhere, but how do we move SQL between Flink and, and uh, Spark and Trino? You know, how do we make this portable and, and actually uh, something that we can move around? Um, then the, the next one is access control, which is where most people don't have uh, any sort of consistent authorization policy. Um, and that's consistent across engines because it doesn't matter if you can get just one engine to enforce your, your authorization policy. These days, if you're using three different engines, you need all three to have the same policy and in, uh, enforce it consistently across the board. Um, and then the last concern here is just losing table structure. Um, one of the biggest sources of um, human work that we've seen in the last few years is uh, losing data structure as you need to move it somewhere. So maybe you're trying to get data over to Snowflake to compute over there, but you've got to dump it into data files and then load it into Snowflake. And there's just a ton of manual work. Um, we also see this with data sets shared between companies. So if you're purchasing a data set, that might just show up in S3 as CSV data. Um, so there's a lot of uh, work to be done in this area. And what I want to focus on is uh, today is specifically what are the requirements for table storage? And we don't want to be in this position. I, I love this image because this is uh, from the last Indiana Jones movie. Um, my dad says this line all the time when I do something stupid. He chose poorly. And then the bad guy basically ages away into dust. Um, and we don't want to be in this situation. We don't want to choose poorly because the choice here is really critical. You know, where you put your data, 
has gravity and it's going to pull you in a direction. You don't want to be without access control or the ability to change it for GDPR. So this is a very important choice. So let's think a bit more about the requirements of, of this architecture and what we need before moving on to, um, I think, what uh, Iceberg can provide and, and why I would choose Iceberg. Um, so first of all, I think there are, there are basically two high level things that everyone wants in this area. Number one is the flexible compute, right? That multi-engine future. Basically what we're trying to get there is flexible compute where we can bring in multiple engines. Because it's very, very unlikely that any single engine or vendor is going to be able to do streaming and batch and ML and just everything that you need for the next 10 or 15 years. Um, we want to have a center of gravity where the compute engines all come and you can use whatever you need. Uh, and this, you know, again, uh, I mentioned Dask earlier, is not just JVM frameworks. So we, we need to have a format and, uh, you know, some sort of interchange that allows us to build things in C++ or Python uh, and take advantage of uh, a lot more broad uh, compute options. Now, the second thing is what we don't currently have. Well, well, it depends. So if you're coming from the Hadoop landscape uh, and you're already using Spark and Trino, then you're used to the flexible compute. Um, on the other hand, if you're coming from uh, the data warehouse world, then you've already got this SQL warehouse behavior um, where tables are just SQL tables. Of course, they have reliable transactions. Of course, you can uh, change those tables in place. Um, and, and this is what I want to talk about the most today, because um, I think we often overlook a lot of the SQL warehouse behavior if we're coming from this world of flexible compute where we've always, uh, where many of us uh, have always been. So we're going to take a look more closely at uh, what SQL warehouse behavior is needed for this multi-engine future. So we're going to talk about Iceberg. Um, I am not even going to pretend to be unbiased here. Um, I think Iceberg is a, a really great format for building this architecture. Um, and there, there are two main reasons. It's the open standard. Um, it is you know, very widely adopted in both open source and commercial databases. Um, and it also has the SQL behavior that we really, really need to add on to this flexible world of, of multiple engines. So um, let's take a, a closer look at this. Um, and this is basically what we're doing. So Iceberg said, hey, what if we just applied data warehouse fundamentals to the big data space? So um, the first thing that Iceberg does is we have this uh, mantra sort of, um, we think icebergs should be invisible. And this is really from the SQL table space where um, you never think about what's underneath my Postgres table. You, you hardly ever think of tables in general. And this is uh, very much untrue in the Hadoop and Hive-like table space. So the, the Hive tables, Hive acid tables, um, Delta Lake, Hoodie, those are all Hive-like tables and they have things in common that violate this principle. And so we said early on that we wanted to be just like a table and, and not distract people. There are you know, two main ways that we do this. So first of all, we want to avoid unpleasant surprises. If you make a change to your table and that change is you know, something that brings back data that you thought had been deleted and completely removed, that's a pretty unpleasant surprise, especially if you uh, find that out when it leaks into a report. So we want to avoid unpleasant surprises. And by that, I actually mean uh, certain things that actually are correctness issues. Um, the other thing is we don't want to steal people's attention. Uh, stealing people's attention is a context switch. It makes them think about what's underneath the table and how do I interact? And it's, it's thinking about what is gonna make this engine perform rather than thinking about what you need to get done. Um, and so we, we don't want you to write a query, run it and then think, oh, how do I make this faster? Yeah, ideally, it should already be, uh, sorry, the, the format should already be doing those things. So these are the two principles that I think really uh, distinguish Iceberg from the Hive-like table formats. So we're gonna go into a bit more detail here. So 
first of all, we're not going to cover reliable updates. Um, even high, you know, the Hive-like formats do this. And so we're not going to talk about transactions today. We're just going to dive into behavior um, and, and what uh, uh, the harder things, I guess. So we're going to talk about these with a, a use case. Um, so I've come up with a fake company. Um, I don't think this exists, although it would be pretty awesome. I know I would certainly buy one. So um, in today's example, congratulations, you are the newest employee at Pooch Fitness. Now, Pooch Fitness is the premium fitness tracker for man's best friend. Uh, so this is just like a, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of those fitness trackers, Fitbit. It's like a Fitbit for a dog. Um, but it's the, the high, you know, premium one. Um, so you just got the, the job and you're Pooch Fitness's first uh, data engineer. Now, turns out we've been receiving data for a long time. We just haven't had a data engineer. Um, events are already flowing. and We've got 12 months worth of data. And that 12 months worth of data means everyone is really eager to start taking advantage of it. So we've got a table, Pooch Logs, uh, like you see over here, that includes just all the events that are coming back from these fitness trackers, which are, you know, uh, uh, LTE, you know, like 4G, 5G, something. Uh, they're, they're really premium. So we get these events all the time. Um, and it has stuff like, you know, how many steps, whether or not it was a possible shake, um, the timestamp, uh, serial number, et, et cetera, et cetera. So we, uh, we need to start taking advantage of this data, but there's a problem. So the problem is you discover email addresses in a device ID column. First thing you do, you're taking a look at just some you know, random uh, rows, uh, count distinct for a couple fields, and you find there's an email address, a customer email address as a device ID. And you say, oh, that can't be correct. Um, so now, your first day on the job, you have to clean up a PII bug. Um, luckily, though, event parsing was fixed. You know, they said, oh, right, that was in Rev 1.3. We already fixed that. Um, and no one is using the device ID. That's just informational. So at this point, you have two choices. Number one, you can babysit a whole bunch of jobs that are just rewriting day after day after day of this event table. Right? You can rewrite a whole year's worth of events, but that's not really how you want to spend your first day on the job or actually your first few weeks on the job. So what if there were an option to? And this is actually you know, standard SQL behavior. So it's ridiculous that some systems can't do this. What if we just dropped the device ID and added the device ID column back, right? So dropping the column gets rid of all that data that no one's using anyway. Then we add the column back and now we can start filling it with data again. That seems like a great plan. Well, it turns out that if you do this in most systems, uh, you, you, uh, <laughs> you, you just added back the device ID column because resolution is by name. So if you delete device ID and add device ID, when you go looking for device ID, you're gonna find all that bad data again. And this unfortunately was the standard in Hive-like tables for 10 years. <laughs> um, Spark does a little better these days, but it's still not great. All it says is, oh, I can't delete anything. Uh, so you just can't drop a column in Spark, which at least is honest, but um, it, it's a little concerning that this is uh, still the state of the art in Hive-like tables. So. What Iceberg does instead is it implements real schema evolution. So just like a, a real SQL table, you get an instantaneous uh, change that drops all of that data or at least makes it inaccessible. Um, you'll have to rewrite it later, um, but it is you know, lazily just gone. Um, you can recover it if you absolutely have to, um, but this gives you the ability to remove it immediately. And then if you need to physically delete it later, you actually can. So this is safe. You don't get undead columns by renaming a column or adding it back. Um, and most importantly, you don't have to spend weeks of your time rewriting an entire table. So um, schema evolution is often look, overlooked, but this is a really powerful part of a data warehouse that Hive-like formats simply don't do. So. Moving on, we have a second problem. 
uh, an analyst comes to you and says, all my queries are slow. I used to like read this table. Um, it, it used to be fine in the first couple of months, but then I looked away for a while, didn't query it. And then it was just way too slow to, uh, to work with. So um, we eventually just gave up and can you help us? Well, as a data engineer, of course you're thinking, I know how to fix this, this is easy. Um, you probably just aren't filtering by partitions. And so now you have to retrain everyone in the company to add additional filters, even though they were already filtering by event timestamp. Um, it's, it's just this quirky thing that Hive-like tables do where you duplicate the, the data into another column and then you tell it to be physically laid out by that column so that everyone has to know the physical layout of the column in order to query the table effectively, because that makes sense. So hopefully you got that right. Now there's another cause. What if we just didn't partition this table? And we'll get to that later. But thinking about this additional partition filter situation, it's a little bit ridiculous, right? Uh, so what Iceberg does instead is it implements hidden partitioning. And this is, again, just like a, a real data warehouse. Um, the layout of a table is hidden from people that are querying. And when you write a, a query and say, give me this timestamp range, even if the data is actually physically laid out by days or hours of that timestamp, um, you don't have to separately add filters for days and hours. It, Iceberg will take your uh, timestamp query and bake that down into filters to match the correct data files automatically. This is so much easier for analysts. And not only that, um, you can, it, it avoids correctness bugs. So many silent correctness bugs happen in these Hive-like formats because we use the wrong uh, time, sorry, uh, the wrong time zone when converting from a timestamp to a date. Or the analyst didn't know the, the timestamp or sorry, the format or the time zone that the date was in. And so they looked for, um, say, August, or sorry, not August, it's April. They looked for April 24th in UTC, but you're uh, using event time or you know, local time zones. Um, so this is a, a massive uh, uh, source of errors. Um, and by hiding this entirely, we make sure all of that is consistent. So you're always getting uh, the consistent conversion between timestamps and days, and the, the database handles that filtering for you. So this is a really, really big um, win for analysts and, and people using the table. So what happens though, if you can't just add additional filters on top of your Hive table? What if you didn't partition this table in the first place? Well, that gets ugly because you can't just add partitions or change partitioning in a Hive-like table. Uh, none of the formats support this. Um, so in this case, no one knew partitioning was a thing and everyone was too busy working on something else. Um, so this means that you're back in that situation where you're rewriting every single data file to migrate into a new table. Only it's actually worse because your, your queries still need to have partition filters. You're still going to have to rewrite every single query that touches this table in order to make it efficient. Um, so this is the worst of both original problems. You have to rewrite the entire table. You have to rewrite all of the queries against that table. And it's just a giant pain. Well, luckily, if you were using Iceberg, this would be different. So Iceberg supports layout evolution. And this is actually just saying, again, let's have a table abstraction that gives us a real table. So we don't have to worry about what's underneath it. Well, if you, can't, if you don't worry about what's underneath your table, then we can make changes to that. So Iceberg implements layout evolution that's lazy. You can add partition fields, remove partition fields, old data stays the way it was, and then new data is written into the new partition fields. Now, Iceberg still helps with this because if you add a partition field, um, we're still going to actually use a more advanced filtering to filter individual data files based on the um, timestamp ranges. So you wouldn't really have even gotten to the place where um, your jobs are too slow to even run if you were using Iceberg. But luckily, um, you can cut down on job planning time and really um, 
really make this table efficient if you just change the layout in place. And again, this saves you from having to rewrite all the queries on the table and also saves you from uh, needing to rewrite all of the data. That's, that's a month worth of headache easily. So bringing all of these things together, um, I, I wanna bring us back to this idea of, you know, what is the foundation for this multi-engine future and, and what are we trying to accomplish? Um, I would say that Iceberg is the foundation. Remember, it's the open standard uh, for analytic tables. Um, it uses SQL behavior and a real table abstraction, unlike the other Hive, uh, Hive table formats. Um, and it just applies these data warehouse fundamentals to have, you know, basically fix the problems before you know you have them. It's a really unpleasant thing to rename a column and realize that, oh, now you have a column with both names <laughs> instead of uh, all of the data moving over into the renamed column. Um, those sorts of things just you know, are distracting and are, you know, going to introduce correctness bugs. Iceberg also allows a couple other things that are even better. So first of all, data services, um, because we can, um, because Iceberg has safe commits, we can build services um, and, and not only have multiple engines in this architecture, but we can have things doing uh, like background compaction, moving data between regions and all sorts of things that uh, humans no longer need to babysit. Um, and lastly, Iceberg supports declarative data engineering, which is um, where we want people to configure the tables and not engines so that uh, if you make a change to the table, you don't have to go find out how this data was being written or maintained and go do something differently. Um, so this is what really enables um, the long-term architecture of uh, using multiple engines together. Uh, you don't want to have to uh, configure each engine and each write individually. Okay, um, I'm going to quickly cover what else a better format can do. Um, so there, there are three main things here. Um, first of all, Iceberg not only has the SQL behavior uh, that we were talking about and the flexibility to use whatever engine you want. Um, it also has faster queries. So Iceberg indexes both data and metadata. Um, it indexes, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, individual columns and keeps track of the range of values in those columns to prune individual data files. Um, it then aggregates that up to the next level in the metadata tree and indexes the metadata itself. So it's super easy to skip through metadata um, and have faster planning in addition to faster jobs. Um, we also, again, I, I mentioned automatic pushdown from hidden partitioning. So you query for the data that you want and Iceberg figures out how to make it fast. Um, data engineering, I mentioned earlier, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but basically the idea is if you have four different engines and a variety of different data services, you don't want to change each one individually to implement a change to something like uh, clustering and sort order. So for iceberg tables, we put the configuration on the table itself and let the infrastructure decide uh, for this right, this is the clustering and sort order I should use. Um, not only that, that makes it easy to manage this whole um, uh, data platform of multiple engines, um, but this also unlocks automatic optimization and recommendations because we can tune and basically go recommend changes in settings uh, to make the, the queries on this table better. And that's something that you simply can't do if you have to go to your scheduler and recompile your Spark job in order to make a change to something like partitioning or sort order or uh, even like parquet tuning settings. Um, lastly, I do want to mention um, Iceberg supports all of the expressive SQL commands. So row level, delete, merge, and update. Um, and the biggest thing to highlight here is that Iceberg supports both eager and lazy strategies. So you can encode all the things that you need to delete for GDPR, but not go rewrite all those data files immediately. You can lazily garbage collect that as needed. Uh, and that really helps uh, efficiency on the, in a, a large table. 
And that's the end of my presentation. I want to say thank you for listening to me. Um, and uh, I'll be answering questions in the live chat if anyone wants to uh, ask more. Thanks a lot.